As I told the kids, the Psalms were at the very heart of daily monastic practice in medieval Ireland. And this Psalm in particular may be at the root of the prayer of St. Patrick, which is actually the first song that we sang this morning. Ah, I had forgotten to get one more little piece of technology here that gives us one more opportunity for things to go amiss. Um, when the psalmist writes, you hem me in behind me and before me, when you lay your hand on me, or in another translation, you surround me front and back. That's the way that Patrick uses this to say, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ on my left and on my right. That sense of being surrounded by God, of being protected by Christ, probably seemed really essential to Patrick, who was, and the Irish would love to deny this, he was a Briton who had been taken captive by Irish slave traders and enslaved in Ireland. We don't really know what Patrick looked like. There are a lot of romantic images. This is actually the earliest image that we have of St. Patrick uh, from the 13th century, but he probably didn't look like that either. After escaping, Patrick felt called to go back and return to Ireland and to bring the gifts of Christianity to the very people who had enslaved him. I mean, I would definitely be praying for God's protection in that environment. One amazing aspect of Patrick's mission in Ireland is that it was accomplished without bloodshed, unlike so many places. He did it by converting the various kings of Ireland and then winning over their druids. One of the distinctive traits of Celtic Christian spirituality is that it is, was far removed from the Roman Mediterranean influence and was therefore able to incorporate some of the aspects of earth-centered spirituality, a pre-Christian culture in Ireland. You know, Ireland actually has three saints, Patrick, uh, Bridget, and Cullum Kill, or St. Columba. Um, the tradition of Bridget goes back to pagan times uh, when she was known to be a goddess. And that stream of the lore gets conflated a little bit with St. Bridget of Kildare, whose followers worshipped in a sacred grove of oak trees, clearly recalling a pagan past. You know, and in Gaelic, the name Kildare comes from two words. Kill means church and Dara means oak. So even today, the sisters of St. Bridget continue their ministry as eco-feminist nuns at a center called Solus Bridi in Kildare. Um, by the way, Brooklyn and Mike's last name, McBride, means a servant of St. Bridget. Um, and if you ever meet somebody named Malcolm, um, their name means a servant of Cullum Kill or St. Columba. One of the lovely pieces of the tradition of St. Bridget is a, a, a prayer that has been attributed to her and handed down through the centuries. I would wish a great lake of ale for the king of kings. That's my kind of saint. <laughs> I would wish the family of heaven to be drinking it throughout life and time. I would wish the men of heaven in my own house, I would wish the vessels of peace to be given to them. I would wish joy to be in their drinking. I would wish Jesus to be here among them. I would wish the three Marys of great name. I would wish the people of heaven from every side. You know, I think most people who live here in the Napa Valley of beer would approve of St. Bridget's prayer. I mean, not only was Bridget herself fond of ale, she was also a landowner. According to legend, she asked a local king for a parcel of land on which to build a monastery. And he agreed, saying that she might have a parcel the size of her cloak. Well, he laughed, thinking how very clever he had been, but his amusement ceased 
when the cloak that she was wearing magically began to expand across the land covering many square miles. It's also said that she was ordained a bishop. Um, and in fact, in this icon, you see two, th she's holding two things. One is the reed cross of St. Bridget, and uh, some of you have made those, I know. And the other thing that you'll notice is she's carrying a bishop's crozier. So um, priests don't get to carry those. You have to be a bishop. Um, so at least in this representation, she's, she is a, bi a bishop. And according to a medieval manuscript, the man who ordained her was a bishop named Mel. Uh, and he responded when his assistant objected by saying, no power have I in this matter. That dignity has been given by God to Bridget beyond every woman. So here we are, 1,500 years later, and women still can't be ordained as priests in the Roman Catholic Church. Though today, the Episcopal Church of Ireland does ordain women, and a woman named Pat Story is the Bishop of Meath and Kildare, <laughs> roughly 50 years after the, the death of Bridget. A young monk named Cullum Kill which means dove of the church, reputedly made a copy of a Psalter without first obtaining permission. This is probably the first copyright case ever tried in Europe. Um, and, and he was banished from Ireland for that. Um, and, and this slide is a, a manuscript that is thought to be in Cullum Kill's own hand. It's the oldest piece of Irish manuscript available. And when Jane Ann and I were leading a pilgrimage in Ireland, we went over a few days early, and I, I called um, the Royal I Irish Academy where this is kept, and I said, can you tell me if the Cahak of St. Cullum Kill is going to be on display? And the woman said, well, it can be. When are you coming? <laughs> <laughs> Things that would never happen in an American museum. So uh, it was there for us, which was lovely. The other way the legend tells it, Cullum Kill caused a battle in Ireland in which so much blood was spilt that he was exiled to the west coast of Scotland beyond the point where one could see Ireland. Uh, again, we don't know what Cullum Kill looked like either, but this is stained glass from Iona Abbey. He landed on Iona, and Cullum Kill was the founding abbot of an abbey on that island in the Western Isles or the Hebrides of Scotland. And from this place, he launched a mission to convert the Picts in and beyond the highlands. In fact, while he was on his way to meet with the ruler of Inverness, he was one of the first people ever to encounter the Loch Ness Monster. Have you ever been to a place where it seems somehow easier to access the sacred. I guess that for some of you, it's being up in the mountains. For others, it's being at the beach. It's probably not sitting in a traffic jam on I-25, though for the really spiritually evolved ones among us, even I-25 can be a sacred space. Cullum Kill's Isle of Iona continues to be what they refer to as a thin place where the veil between this world and the next is permeable. And some of us who have visited Iona sense that it's a place that has the patina burnished in by many centuries of prayer and religious devotion. And it's still a place of pilgrimage today. And it's one of the significant stops Jane Ann and I made when we led uh, a pilgrimage to Scotland. After my first pilgrimage um, in the Celtic world uh, in 2007 with Marcus Borg and Don Crossan, I was left wondering if Celtic Christianity was just sort of vaguely remembered uh, past without much of a contemporary expression the ancient high crosses and the, the ruins of monastic communities are amazing to witness. But I knew there had to be more. 
And that question led me to start a small group at Plymouth called Living Celtic Christianity to explore the dimensions of that tradition that we can use in our faith lives today. One of the ways the group initially found a focus was to try to live out the five-fold rule of the Iona community, and, and rule in a sense of a monastic guideline, not a hard and fast law. And that rule includes daily prayer and Bible reading, being accountable to one another for our use of time and of money, and of working for social justice. You know, the Iona community was actually founded as an urban ministry during the Great Depression by George MacLeod, a Church of Scotland minister. And one of the community's first projects together was to rebuild the 12th century uh, abbey. And what that meant was employment for unemployed shipyard workers and also for men, young clergymen. And they were only clergymen then in the Church of Scotland. So they began in the 1930s and they didn't finish till 1966. And the Iona community today preserves the abbey and its buildings as a site for pilgrimage and education each summer. So if you want to go there, it's available. You know, one of the amazing things that happened on Iona before the stone abbey was built was the creation of the Book of Kells. Um, in the scriptorium on Iona. It's an ornate uh, copy of the four gospels. And it's a stellar example of insular manuscripts and it's currently on display at Trinity College in Dublin. The scriptorium on Iona and other Irish influenced abbeys created some of the most beautiful art in the Middle Ages as well as preserving copies of Greek and Latin manuscripts from the pre-Christian era, while some continental cop uh, copies were being used as kindling. And that led one Irish scholar to claim that the Irish had saved civilization. Well, maybe they did, but that's not the reason. <laughs> the Iona community has been a source for rebirth in contemporary Celtic Christian spirituality. And two of its exponents have visited us here at Plymouth, first as a part of the Lilly Grant that I wrote for my first sabbatical, and then um, as visiting scholars. Uh, John Bell, who retired from the Iona community in uh, 2023, has been with us at Plymouth two times and is a renowned theologian and musician in some of John's work we sing many Sundays, including um, at the 11 o'clock service, we'll be singing Be Still and Know. Uh, John and his collaborator, Graham Mall, worked hard to use Scottish folk melodies and set them to reflect current liberal Christian themes. The other person associated with the Iona community who's been with us multiple times is John Philip Newell. Um, John Philip has written extensively on Celtic Christianity and has really helped to extend the Celtic Christian tradition. So at the nine o'clock service, we always chant the Lord's Prayer, ground of all being. Those, those are John Philip's words. And if you look elsewhere in the bulletin this morning, you'll see that we use other aspects of um, today's liturgy from the Iona community. And when we say, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, no, for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to, uh, to God. Again, those are the words that come from the liturgy of the Iona community. Um, one of John Philip's books, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, and Christ of the Celts really helped to break down barriers um, between traditional Christianity and the a contemporary expression of Celtic Christianity. Here's one of um, John Philip's prayers that I wanted to share with you. O God of new beginnings, who brings light out of night's darkness and fresh green out of the hard winter earth, there's barren land between us as people and as nations this day. There are empty stretches of soul within us. Give us eyes to see new dawnings of promise. 
Give us ears to hear fresh soundings of birth. If you're interested in doing more with John Philip, he's going to be back in Colorado in May, and he's going to be doing a three-day retreat down at La Foray, our um, camp in the Black Forest. You know, if you wander out past the West Wing into our memorial garden, the most um, distinctive feature of it is a, a stone slab cross that's about that tall. When we were designing and building the garden, um, we took a photograph uh, that I had taken in Glendalough, Ireland, and we got an LCD projector and we projected it onto this big sandstone slab and we traced it for the, uh, the mason who came in. Um, so Glendalough is in the Wicklow Mountain south of Dublin and it was one of the first monastic communities in Ireland. I like to, to think that that cross keeps watch over the ashes of our beloved out in the memorial garden. Tom Dilly, who helped design and construct the garden, asked me about a brief blessing that I always um, read when I'm interring somebody's ashes or a body, and because he, he thought we should engrave that on a stone which now stands at the entrance to the garden and the labyrinth. It's a blessing from this book by the late Irish poet, priest, and philosopher John O'Donohue. The book is called To Bless the Space Between Us. May perpetual light shine upon the faces of all who rest here. May the lives they live unfold further in spirit. May all their past travails find ease in the kindness of clay. May the remembering earth mind every memory they brought. May the rain from the heavens fall gently upon them. May the wildflowers and grasses whisper their wishes into light. May we reverence the village of presence in the stillness of this silent field. Those lines are not just on the rock, they're also in to bless the space between us. In fact, I think I've given away more copies of this book than any other. It, it's a treasure um, that helps us to unfold the Celtic gift of blessing. You know, there's so much to discover about Celtic, the Celtic tradition in Christianity, and you can explore it even if you have a surname like Corpenning or Fioriti, <laughs> with all due respect, to the McBrides and the Fergusons. This spiritual tradition can provide wellsprings of wisdom and growth and sustenance as we confront things like hatred, environmental de devastation, war, and political dissension. We need to find wellsprings of spiritual strength to confront such things. We don't need to do it on our own. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.